Great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Software Engineering. Welcome to Comp 3350. Uh, communication levels right now are real high. They're real high. I wonder if there's something important that you are supposed to be working on. Yeah, OK, great, good. Uh, so welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering 1. Um, today, I want to spend some time looking at a few different things. I want you, at the end of today's lecture, to be able to describe and identify technical debt. The way that we're going to be looking at this is uh, primarily in the form of, here's some technical debt. Let's try to think about what kind of technical debt this is. So what led to this situation? I want you to be able to release software on GitLab. This is an important topic for the thing that you're probably talking about quite loudly right now. Uh, I really just want to show this very quickly. This isn't something I want to spend a lot of time talking about. I just want to show you the mechanical process of what I'm looking for you to do here. I want you to be able to define coupling and cohesion and identify cases of low coupling and low co cohesion or high coupling and high cohesion. This is probably the second or third time that you've seen this pair of words across different courses. So this is hopefully more of a review than anything else. And, uh, and yeah, so let's move on here. Uh, first, some announcements. Uh, oh, I didn't refresh this page. First, there's some announcements. Where did I put those announcements? I'll announce them. I'll just announce them verbally. The first announcement is the first iteration delivery date is no longer today. It's on Sunday now. Uh, so I, I talked with Saulo, the other instructor for the other section of the course. And we decided together that we would uh, push the delivery date for iteration one back to Sunday at 4.30. Uh, the way that you deliver it is still the same. So it's still going to be whatever's up on, on GitLab um, when that time passes that we're going to be evaluating. The part of the rationale for this is that we want you to have a little bit more time with the feedback that you got from iteration zero uh, to make changes if you needed to make changes to what you had done. So if you needed to make more features or user stories for iteration one, you'd have a bit of a chance to do that. But also iteration one is, uh, iteration one is the worst. Iteration one is always the worst because there's a lot more than just working on code that's going on. There's a lot of like figuring out what everybody's communication styles are and what everybody's work style is. So we want to give you a little bit of a break. We want to give you a little bit of break with that. We're, we're not going to be giving extensions for other iterations. There won't be extensions for other iterations. And the rationale for that is that the the, the agile process that we're following here really is supposed to be deliver what you've done, not like fit as much as you can into this thing. Deliver what you have done and then get feedback on what you have done. Future releases will also just have more time in between when you start and when you actually make the delivery. Um, but yeah, this is the last time that we're going to be making that, uh, that kind of an extension. The other announcement. Uh, is that there's a there's a test on Tuesday in our section. Uh, the test material that is examinable on that test is going to be everything up until today's lecture, so everything up to today inclusive. There have been required readings uh, in the last few weeks. The required readings that I would say that you should think about reading if you haven't read them already is up to the technical debt readings. The software design stuff, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to read that, but we're going to look at that next week more than this week. And I don't want to put anything more on your plate than is necessary right now. Uh, are there any questions about the test before I move on? It's a 50 minute test. I didn't say that. It's a 50 minute test. So we have a 75 minute slot, but because the other section is 50 minutes, uh, just to make it fair to everyone, uh, we will also have a 50 minute test. Uh, yeah. yeah. Will you have, oh, no. <laughs> uh, so there will be no class after that. Part partly because, uh, and there definitely isn't going to be class before it. So that would be terrible. Uh, the reason there's no class after it is because people finish tests at different times. And I don't want you like waiting outside in the hallway and then have to come back in for 15 minutes. It doesn't really make any sense. So there won't be a class after that. 
Yeah. Am I going to upload some sample tests? Uh, like, what, what do you mean sample tests? Oh, like, like examples of tests that have been given in the past. No, I wasn't planning on uploading samples of tests that have been given in the past. The advice that I'd probably give you in terms of thinking about what you should be preparing for is uh, looking at the kinds of things I'm asking you to do in class. Look at the things that I'm asking you to do in class to give you a sense of what you might expect to see on a test. Good. Keep going. Okay, good. Good. All right. Oh, yeah, there's one more thing I wanted to announce. Gosh, I wish I would have just saved that file before I uh, got here. One of the things that we like to do in this course is give you a physical device to run your apps on. We like to do that in this course because it kind of makes it feel a little bit more tangible. The devices that we have, we bought about 10 years ago when not everybody had a, a device on their person all the time. They're fine. They work. They're fine. They're Nexus 7 tablets. They're, I think, the 20, 2014 variation of the Nexus 7 tablet. They're fine. They work. They're functional. We haven't really used them much in the last couple of years because we haven't really had in-person classes in the last couple of years. And we've been relying primarily on the emulator for people to, to do their work. One of the problems with the emulator is that it takes a lot of resources to run an emulator on your system on top of Android Studio. Uh, we have devices. We have devices that you can borrow to use for this project for development if you want. But we also unfortunately don't have enough devices for all teams across both sections. I, I want to quickly get a sense of, of how many people actually want a device. And the way I want to ask is, it, it can be at probably at most one per team. But the way I want to ask is just, you, you can talk to your peers right now if you want for 30 seconds, but uh, just want to show up hands to get a sense of how much demand there is for a physical device. OK, just quickly put your hand up if you want a device. OK, OK. Uh, what's probably going to happen then is that I'm going to ask you to go pick them up somewhere, but I'm going to tell you more about that next week. So not today. I need to work that out with our tech staff to figure out how to approach it. But uh, if you do want a device, I will let you know next week how we're going to accomplish that. OK, good. So let's move on. Let's, uh, let's talk about technical debt. You have all been feverishly working on an application. You've all been feverishly working on a project. You're trying to implement features. You're trying to build user stories. And there's two really broad classifications of the ways that we can approach doing this. There's the fast way, the quick way, and there's the slow way. The quick way and the slow way might look quite similar to you right now, just in terms of the pace that you're able to achieve with you know, something new that you've never done before. But these are two broad classifications of approaches that we can have with building a new feature. The quick but messy way is summarized as, let's just get it done now. I don't care what the code looks like. I don't really care what the code looks like, and I don't care much about what it's going to look like in terms of how do we make this thing better in the future? How do we build on it? How do we add to it? The good thing with this is that you're going to get faster delivery. You just you know, slam the keyboard, you get your feature done, and you don't really think much about it beyond that. The problem with it is that if you just bang this feature out without giving any kind of conscious or consideration to the design of what you're doing and how it fits into your bigger architecture, making changes to that thing 
and making changes to the rest of your system, depending on what part of a thing that you're doing, may make changes, making changes to the system harder in the future. So you get a quick payoff. The feature is done. You can deliver it to your clients, but you have to like, you're going to pay something for that later in the future when you have to maybe fix it or spend more time building new features because of the design choices that you made or didn't make when you're delivering this feature. The slow way is let's do this deliberately. Let's take a look at the design that we've got. Let's look at the architecture. Let's think about how this feature or user story fits into that code. What do we need to do? And then let's start building it. So take some time to do the design for this upfront and then start implementing it after you've spent some time. The problem with this is that you're paying that thing right now. You're paying for it immediately because you're stopping and thinking about it before you start actually writing code to build features. And that's not great. It doesn't feel great. But the benefit is you, you don't have to go about thinking very hard about how to make those changes later because you put that thought in at the beginning. And that's a good thing. I'm not going to show you the three-tier architecture, but I want you to think about it. We uh, we spent a lot of time talking about three-tier architectures. I could go back and like replay the the recordings of how much time we've spent talking about three-tier architectures, but I'd say at this point that it's I don't know, an hour and a half? Maybe it's an hour and a half across everything that we've done. I'd like you to put yourself in your shoes on day one of this course. And you've got Android Studio in front of you right now. And you're starting to write code. I'm just immediately telling you what features you need to build for this project. What would your code look like if I didn't give you any idea of what a three-tier architecture is? I didn't spend the time, we all together didn't spend the time to think about that. I suspect it would look something like this. I suspect it would look something like this. Probably not exactly like that. I don't think anybody has spindles of CDs on their desks anymore. I suspect it would look something like this. We put a lot of time, we paid a lot of time, we spent a lot of time thinking about, getting on the same page about, and talking about architectural designs so that we wouldn't get into that situation. Your code might not be like perfectly designed and separated into three-tier architectures right now, and that, that's okay because you're just kind of getting started. But if I had not done anything with that, if we hadn't together thought about three-tier architectures, it would be a mess. It would be a terrible mess. This idea of we've got this effort and time that we're putting into something and we're spending it and we're saving it later or we have to pay it back later. This whole idea is what is kind of covered under this broad term technical debt. Technical debt is this idea that we just built something and eventually we're gonna have to pay it back later, either because we are going to have interest. So do we all have credit cards? Does everybody have a credit card here? Yes? Yeah, we all know how credit cards work. You don't pay the bill, you have to pay interest on the bill. Okay, good. The general sense with technical debt is that we're borrowing time and we're having to pay back time and effort as we're going on with it. Martin Fowler, Martin Fowler is a really popular uh, big name in software development and software engineering. You'll see his name 
Throughout this course, you'll see his name in industry when you get into industry and you start reading books and stuff, talking to people. Martin Fowler came up with this idea of this technical debt quadrant. And what Martin is saying is that there's technical debt. There is technical debt and there is no technical debt. But when there is technical debt, there are different kinds of technical debt. There's different ways to think about technical debt. I'm going to pop this open in a new tab and I'm going to make it bigger so we can all read it. Don't need to save it. I already have this. There's four different things that we're trying to balance when we're thinking about what kind of technical debt that we have. There's prudent technical debt or reckless technical debt. And it's kind of a balance between the two of those. And there's deliberate technical debt and there's inadvertent technical debt. And it's a balance between the two of those. Prudent and deliberate technical debt. Prudent and deliberate technical debt is I know that there are consequences, deliberate. I know that there are consequences. I'm going to have to pay something for this in the future. I know that there's something there that I'm doing wrong, and I know that I'm going to have to fix it later. And prudent is we, we just got to do it. We have to go now, and we have to deliver this. We're intentionally doing this. We know that there's something that we're going to have to pay back later, and that's OK. Deliberate and reckless technical debt is, we don't have time for design. <laughs> I know that this is the wrong way to do it, but I'm just going to do it anyway, and I don't care. I don't care. I don't think about fixing it. I just don't have time to do this. I don't have time to think about design. I'm just going to build it and deliver it, and then whatever. There's prudent and inadvertent. And when we're thinking about technical debt, this is reflecting back on what you've done already and then realizing that you have incurred debt. We know now how we should have done it. If I said to you, hey, start building an application, and then two weeks later, this is the three-tier architecture, that would have been this case here. Now you know how you should have done it after you've done it already. This is how we can approach paying it back if we want to. We didn't know that we were doing it at the time. It was inadvertent, but we're prudently going to deal with it or we know how to deal with it now. Reckless and inadvertent, what's layering? What's a three-tier architecture? This is, I don't know how to do this and I don't care. I'm just going to do it anyway. The trade-offs, when we're thinking about this idea of technical debt and trying to avoid it, are things like analysis paralysis. Has anybody heard of that before? Just out of curiosity, one person, two people. Analysis paralysis is this idea that you get stuck in the design phase because your design is never good enough. It never feels good enough that you can proceed. You're worried about incurring debt so you never get past the point of just designing it and building it before you get to building it. Analysis paralysis is, I mean, it's not good to get stuck there, but it's something that can happen. Agile, 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 our goal here is to deliver working software. Delivering working software sometimes comes with this idea that we're incurring technical debt and we're doing it recklessly. We don't have time for design. There's this perception that agile is, we don't have time for design. We're just going to build something. But that's not necessarily true. Technical debt is not a bad thing. Debt, debt, debt feels bad. Just, you know, the idea of having debt feels bad. But technical debt is not bad in the same sense that credit card debt is not bad. We use credit cards all the time. We use credit cards all the time now to pay for stuff because it's convenient. We're not paying for it right now, but that's OK. It's OK not to pay for something as you're doing it. It's OK not to pay for something immediately as you're doing it. Technical debt is the same metaphor as what credit cards are in the financial world. Technical debt is your borrowing from your future time right now, and you'll pay it back later. As long as you are consciously doing it, it's not really a bad thing. 
I put together some uh, case studies. And what I want us to do together is look at them and then make decisions about the kind of technical debt that's in there. So I've got this technical debt quadrant, and I've got some prob basically problems or situation statements, and I want you to decide what kind of technical debt is in this thing. This, uh, this document, this is on the course web page. I'm, I'm going to read these to you. This is story time with Franklin now. I'm going to read these to you. I'm going to put this technical debt quadrant on the screen. And then what we're going to do is, uh, is do a Mentimeter about it. So let me read this to you. Let me read this first one to you. So we've been building Notflix. We've got this idea of a payment processor. It's this thing that's taking the credit card information and, uh, and we're sending it to the, the credit card company. The implementation that we've got for this has grown quite big. It's about 10,000 lines long. And even though it has been relatively well tested, let's say it's got 80% code coverage. Let's say that it's fairly well tested. People are terrified of making changes to the payment processor. And their, their fear is basically, if we make changes here, something else might break somewhere else. Lucille is, uh, is somebody that works on the Notflix team, and she has been given the task of adding a new feature that requires making changes to this payment processor. She looks at this code, and she realizes that it's not in a great state. It's pretty big. Yes, it's well tested, but it's, it's pretty big, and the design kind of lacks. So she thinks that she can either add the existing feature now, or she can refactor the class. She can take that class, that payment processor class, and break it up into smaller parts. But doing that is going to put the, the release back of this feature. It's going to push it back, so she won't be able to deliver it on time. Lucille talks to her manager, and the both of them basically come to an agreement that she should add the feature to the existing class now. And they're going to make time in the next release. So instead of Lucille being given a user story in the next release, she's just going to get a chance to work on this payment processor class and break it up into smaller pieces. What kind of technical debt is this? This is definitely technical debt, but what kind is it? I'm going to pop up our quadrant here. I'm going to give you just two minutes to talk about this with your team to decide what kind of technical debt this is. And it's a balance between reckless, prudent, deliberate, and inadvertent. And then I'm going to put the Mentimeter up after that. Please go ahead. All right. OK. So if you, uh, if you haven't put anything in, put something in real quick. But uh, I think I agree with this. The, the state that they're in right now the state that they're in right now, so if we're thinking about like, it's already got 10,000 lines of code, it's already got 10,000 lines of code, that part of it, that part of the technical debt, that, that's technical debt, that might be reckless and inadvertent, we don't really know. But what I'm agreeing with you with, what I'm agreeing with you on here is Lucille's decision and her manager's decision. Let's just ship it now. Let's build it ship it now, and we're going to deal with the consequences later. We're going to come back to this after we've released it and make changes to it to fix it. OK, good. Let's do the next one. So here's, uh, here's case study two. We're still working on Notflix here. Buster has been tasked with, uh, with handling credit card validation. credit card validation in the Notflix app. And this is his first co-op work term. Oh no. The dev team, this is a co-op student. The dev team thinks this is going to be a pretty easy task. This is going to be a really straightforward task. Validating credit card numbers is well documented and straightforward. They are giving him all the documentation that he needs to figure out what validation is required for credit card numbers, offline validation of credit card numbers. Buster, having taken this class, recognizes that there's a lot of different kinds of errors that can come from credit card validation. 
And what he's done is he has implemented a credit card validation mechanism that has a deeply nested hierarchy of classes that represent all of the different kinds of errors that can happen with credit card inputs. So there's six to seven levels. We did not go to six to seven levels. Buster did not listen in this class very well. Buster didn't document this hierarchy of exception types. And then he left to go back to school. And now the dev team needs to add a new kind of revocation to credit card numbers. So there's some kind of like neo-financial or something we'll say. They're popular these days. They're around trying to hire people. Neo-financial has a new credit card and uh, the Notflix team wants to add that to the credit card validation mechanism. What kind of technical debt is this? So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna put that quadrant up for a couple minutes, for one minute, and then I'll pop open the slide on, uh, on Mentimeter. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you, fully agree with you. I believe that this is reckless and inadvertent. Buster doesn't know this is his first co-op work term. He doesn't really know. He's trying to apply the things that he's learned in class. Don't get me wrong. They're good things to apply. They are good things to apply. But maybe this doesn't actually resonate with the way that the dev team is doing validation in other places. Maybe this doesn't work the same way. And maybe Buster hasn't spent time doing that. Is it reckless? We don't really have enough information in this situation to know, but we can assume that Buster hasn't actually talked to anybody about this. Buster didn't talk to anybody about it. He didn't document it, and the dev team's trying to do something with it, and they don't know what it is. They don't know what it looks like because they're trying to find the documentation, and they can't. So Buster didn't know what to do, and he just went ahead and did it anyway, and, and that's technical debt. That's a good case of technical debt here because somebody is going to have to pay it back and that somebody here is the dev team as they're trying to add a new type of credit card to the system. Let's take a look at one last little case study here. So our last character here is Tobias and Tobias has been asked to build an Android app for Netflix. So it's been primarily a web based interface up until this point. And now Tobias has to start working on building an Android app for it. This is the first time that Tobias has built an Android application. He starts on building the app. He spends some time thinking about common architectures that are used for Android applications and then decides to use a three-tier architecture. When he's writing the logic layer, so the thing that's in the middle, he starts to include many Android specific packages and classes because he's not really sure how to pass data and errors between activities in an Android application. So what I mean by this is quite literally, you know, you've got these different activity classes for different screens. He doesn't know how to send information between those things and errors between those things. So he starts to try and merge it into the logic layer. Management, decides that they want to have a desktop application. The web browser, eh, it's fine, but they want to use a desktop app to get more performance or something. I don't know. They've got their reasons why they want to do it. And since Tobias has written the app in Java, he hasn't moved into the 21st century and started writing stuff in Kotlin. They decide that it shouldn't be too hard to build a desktop application because they can just use Java UI libraries that are built into the JDK. The problem now is that Tobias realizes that the tight coupling, so mixing together the logic layer and the Android implementation, so mixing them together so they depend on each other, is going to make adding this new user interface difficult. What kind of technical debt is this? I'll do the same thing. I'll put up the quadrant and then I'll move to the Mentimeter after about a minute. I think the way it's being stretched out now, I think I agree with that. When it was a perfect diamond shape, I, I, I have no idea what to do there. This to me, Tobias's situation, is uh, prudent and I think inadvertent. He's, uh, you know, he's trying to do the right thing. He really is trying to do the right thing. He, he is spending a little bit of time figuring out what kind of architecture to use. But the reality is he still doesn't really know how to use that architecture. 
He doesn't know how to use it. So he is being prudent. He's spending time putting effort into thinking about the design here, but then not really being able to follow through on it and not really being able to make sure that things stay separated from one another. It's inadvertence because he doesn't know. And I think that this part here, he realizes that adding the logic layer is going to make adding a new UI difficult. I think that kind of drives it home. He maybe realizes after the fact that he's got to like get this stuff out of the logic layer and fix it. Now he knows how he should have done it, but only after he's already started doing it. All right. We're okay with technical debt. Good, 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 good. Technical debt is, uh, technical debt's done. Let's stop talking about technical debt. Let's talk about releasing code. I don't want to dwell on this. I really don't want to dwell on this. That went way longer than I thought it was. Uh, there's a bunch of mechanisms for releasing software. So there's physical media. This is less common now, but you can still actually buy, you can buy a USB drive, Microsoft USB drive that has like Windows on it, which I was surprised to find out, but you can buy it. Uh, but more commonly now it's digital distribution. So things like putting your app in the app or the pl Play Store, uh, or putting it up on something like Steam, building your own website and then putting uh, installers on that website and open source releases on GitHub or GitLab. And we're gonna spend some time thinking about releasing code on GitLab because that's what you're using and that's what we're gonna be doing in this course. Step zero is uh, before you actually start releasing any code, you kind of have to get everyone on your team to agree that the release is actually ready to make sure that we're all like, yes, this is a releasable piece of work, let's do it. Once you have come to that decision, then you have to tag the revision that you're planning to release. A tag is something that gives a name to a commit in Git. That's what it's doing. Your commits have these really long uh, SHA-1 sums. I believe it's a SHA-1 sum of the commit that you've made. So it's this long alphanumeric thing that represents uniquely the commit that you've made. A tag gives you the ability to put some human readable uh, reference onto a specific commit. So to say this is iteration one or release one or version one or whatever. Then in GitLab, you can create a new release using the tag that you have created. Tagging the revision is something that you can do in Android Studio. It's something that you can do on the command line or it's something that you can do in GitLab. And I'm gonna show you how to do it in GitLab. You can create a new release from that tag and GitLab, once you create a new release, will do things like make packages of the source code that's in the repository so you can download it as a zip file. Once you create this release, you should make some release notes describing what's done, what you plan to do, what you finished, what you weren't able to finish, and what you're moving on to the next iteration. Attach a binary to the release message. So you're building APKs with Android Studio. Uh, you can attach uh, uh, you can attach these binaries to the release message in GitLab. Let's take a look on GitLab. So I've got the sample project opened up here. You can kind of follow along with your own if you want. On the left side of the screen, under the repository. Uh, tab, there's this tags option that you can pick. So I'm going to click on that. My repository doesn't have any tags yet. This is exactly the same state that your repositories are in right now, unless you have diligently been adding tags. You can click new tag here. And then what the tag name is, is some kind of human readable something, some kind of human readable identifier that says this is what this thing is. So I'm going to call this iteration one. Uh, you can't put spaces in this. You can't have spaces, so I'm using hyphens instead of spaces, uh, but it can be alphanumeric. I don't think you can put special characters in it. It's got to be something that you can write in, uh, in a command on the command line. 
So I'm saying iteration one. There's options here that say to use an existing branch name tag or commit SHA. The branch name is whatever the latest revision is on this branch. So you're going to have a bunch of branches. You can just pick a branch and make a release from that. Or you can copy and paste the uh, commit ID into this dropdown, and it will let you pick that as a revision to tag. I'm going to pick the main branch. And I'm going to make a, a release message. So this is what I did this time. The first thing, one, two, three. OK, great, excellent. And then I'm going to click Create Tag. Now I've got a tag. I can check this out on the command line. So I can clone a repository and I can check out that specific tag without having to know what the iteration or without having to know what the uh, the commit ID is. I don't have to know what this string is. After we do this, then we can make a release. So if you go down here on the left side of the screen, there's a releases tab under deployment. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to create a new release here. And the thing that I have to choose for, for the release is a tag. This is the thing that I want to make a release for. I can give it a release title. This is a human readable thing. The milestones, you can choose to use the milestones that you've created if you're using milestones. But then the release notes, this is the part where you can either put the messages that you put into the tag itself. You can just copy and paste that if you want. But the important thing here is to click this attach file or image. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go all the way to the sample project here. App, build, I think it's outputs, APK, and uh, I'll pick Android test here. I'm going to pick this APK file, and it will upload it. And it's going to just dump a link into this preview, uh, into this release note. And then this turns into a link that I can, that I can click on and download the APK for the, the release that you've made. You can add other stuff here if you want to. I'm going to click Create Release. And then what we've got here are all of the assets that GitLab has created for us. So these are just um, packages of the source code. And then this is the thing that we uh, that we just added the binary for the for the APK. Good, good. Yeah, I don't really want to dwell on this. This is more of a very mechanical. This is how you use GitLab thing. So I'm going to move on. All right. So let's spend some time talking about design principles. Uh, this is hopefully going to be a little bit of review at the beginning anyway because we're going to be talking about this in terms of coupling and cohesion, but we're going to try and define this a little bit more clearly than what you may have seen in other courses. We are going to be thinking at first about the principles of simple design, and these are principles of four principles that have been put together by Kent Beck and Martin Fowler. So there's his name already again. You're seeing it again already. That might be intentional on my part. Kent Beck is another name that you might see frequently in uh, software development when you're thinking about um, you know, doing design and, and reading technical books and stuff like that. Kent Beck and Martin Fowler came up with four principles of simple design. The first principle that they came up with is that the code that you write, the application that you build, should pass the tests. It should pass the tests. You have been working with your customer, with your client, to, to decide what your app should do. The stuff that you build for your client should pass the tests that demonstrate that it's doing what you agreed that that software should do. The second is that the code that you, that you write should reveal intention. And this is one of Kent Beck's rules. And what Kent is trying to say here is that the code that you're writing should be simple enough to read the code and then understand what it does. So somebody that has the similar technical background to you should be able to just open your code, spend a couple of minutes reading it, and be able to broadly understand what you're trying to accomplish with that piece of code. 
Another principle of simple design that Kent Beck and Martin Fowler are describing here is no duplication. And they mean this in a couple of ways. They mean this in the literal code sense. So there's acronyms like DRY, don't repeat yourself. You might have seen some of this in Comp 2150. But they also mean this in another way. When you're thinking about designing an app and the features that it has, don't have the same features in different places in the app. Try to minimize the number of places that you've got something so that it's in one place. So there's one canonical way to do something. And the last one that they say is that a simple piece of software, one that follows simple design principles, should have the fewest elements possible. The idea here is that the code that you write should minimally solve the problem that you're trying to solve, and it shouldn't do anything else. It shouldn't go beyond and try to do something else that is not part of the problem that you're working on right now. They not only came up with these four principles, but they also gave priority to them. Passes the test is the primary thing that you should be striving for when you're building something that follows these simple design principles. Passes the tests again. You've worked with your client to decide what this software should do. Demonstrate that it's doing what it's supposed to do. That is the most important thing that Kent Beck and Martin Fowler are thinking about in terms of simple design. Revealing intention and no duplication, they are less important than passing the tests. Passing the test should always be the first thing that you're trying to do. Reducing duplication and writing code that tells you what it's supposed to do should be secondary. And fewest elements, while it's important, is the least important of these principles to concern yourself with when you're thinking about building software. Coupling and cohesion are two words that you have probably seen before in the context of software development. Coupling and cohesion go kind of hand in hand with this idea of these four simple design principles. Coupling and cohesion formally are measurements of relationship between units and within units. I'm not really specifying what units is here, but coupling is the measurement of relationship between units. Cohesion is the measurement of relationship within a single unit. And these software design rules and principles are really affecting coupling and cohesion. We're going to be spending more time next week looking at other software design principles. But even these minimal uh, simple design rules are kind of making effects to the way that you have uh, coupling and cohesion in your code. Coupling is this measurement of dependencies between components. We've got this three-tier we've got this three-tier architecture. And the goal with the three-tier architecture is that we have a presentation layer, and this is our Android specific section. This is where everything Android is supposed to go. We've got a logic layer in the middle that fits between the presentation layer and the persistence layer. If we have high coupling between the presentation layer and the logic layer, then we start to have Android code in the logic layer. The presentation layer depends heavily on how the logic layer is implemented. If we have low coupling, then the implementation of the presentation layer doesn't care that much about how its backend is implemented in terms of that logic layer. So we've separated those two things out completely from each other. Overall, low coupling is good. We're striving to have low coupling. We don't want to have classes that span across different tiers of our architecture depending heavily on each other's implementations. Cohesion is measuring relationships within a component. So we have a single unit, and we're trying to measure how much relationship there is between all of the things that are in the single unit. This is related to this idea of the Unix philosophy. 
I know a lot of people don't really love using the terminal and the command line, but the Unix philosophy here is that the tools that you have at your disposal on the command line on a Unix system, every one of those things is ideally supposed to do one job and it's supposed to do it as well as possible. And you should be able to compose those things together to build something more complex. The sort command, its job is to sort lines of input. That's all it should do. If you wanna do something else, like get counts of how many things there are, you should use a different tool like WC. The Unix philosophy is do one thing and do it well. I wanna bring up string.java here. This is, uh, this is the source code for string.java. When we're looking through string.java, this is terrible because it's not even syntax highlighted. I'm sorry, I apologize. When we're looking through this, if we were to look at all of the different methods and all of the different properties that are in this class, they're all entirely related to strings which kind of makes sense. They all have to do with managing that right there. All of the methods that are inside of string.java are all related to working with this byte array of characters. The string class within Java doesn't really know how to parse numbers. So think back to using integer.parseint. You had to use that, right? Yeah, yeah, you had to use that. Sometimes I forget like how whether you use scanner more or less and then when things fell off in 1010. You had to use integer.parseint. The string class here, string.java, it does not have anything to do with parsing numbers. It doesn't have anything to do with parsing dates. Other classes have that responsibility and they can create instances of this string class, but the string class itself doesn't do anything that's not related to just managing this array of bytes that happens to be contained within this class. The string class is a highly cohesive piece of code. Everything that's in here is related to managing this array of bytes and characters. Having high cohesion, this is good. This is something that we are striving for. We want to make sure that we've got an implementation of something that is highly cohesive and it does what it says it does internally and it doesn't do much else than that. I'd like to now look at a few different examples and I want you and your team to decide whether or not this has high or low coupling and cohesion. The structure of this is, is it's going to be identical to what we were just doing with technical debt, except we're only measuring two things here, coupling and cohesion, and we're trying to decide whether it's high or whether it's low. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and I'm going to show you some code samples. I'm going to give you a minute to talk with your team, and then I'll pop open a Mentimeter, and we can decide what this is. Here is the first picture. So I'm going to put two minutes on my timer. Does this picture represent high cohesion or low cohesion, high coupling or low coupling? Go ahead, talk. All right. I, uh, yeah, I fully agree with this. This is very low coupling and it has very high cohesion. I'd say that this is true in a couple of different ways. I'm going to put this, uh, this bigger picture up here again. This is a highly cohesive thing. It's a highly cohesive thing. This big block in the middle here is good for pushing pixels around and doing multric, ma multrix, matriplication, matrix multiplication. It's good for doing that. It's highly cohesive because this doesn't really do anything with sound. This doesn't really do anything with like persistence. Its job is purely to do graphic stuff, and that's, that's it. This has very low coupling, and I'm going to say in two different places this has low coupling. This has low coupling in this sense of the place that we talked about before, 
the display that we plug into this doesn't have to know anything about how this is implemented. It's just expecting that signal to come out. So there's low coupling between the device that you're attaching to it on one side, and there's low coupling between uh, the device that you attach on one side and the implementation inside of this thing. It doesn't care whether we've got an AMD or an NVIDIA GPU. It just works. There's also low coupling in another part that we didn't really talk about here. There's low coupling here because this is just a PCI Express device. We can just plug it into that slot. The actual implementation of what's on the other side of that bus, we don't really care that much about. There is one place where there is high coupling and it's kind of outside of this picture. The place where there is high coupling between this device and something else is in the display driver. The display driver has to be tightly coupled to this specific implementation of a card. If you go to NVIDIA's website, you get these drop downs that are like, pick the generation that you have and then pick the specific card that you have. And then it tries to give you the correct kind of driver for the card that you've got. And the same is true on the NVIDIA website. You have to download a very specific driver to drive this specific GPU at the best performance it can go. We could also argue that there is somewhat low coupling with like the default drivers that come with the operating system. Windows can drive this thing because it looks like a display device and that's it. If we want it to work the best that it can though, we have to get something that's tightly coupled with that actual implementation. We're good, that's good, good. Here's the next thing. Same deal, I'm gonna put two minutes on my timer, you got one minute to talk, and then I will pop up the Mentimeter, an adult. Coupling and cohesion, there's a bunch of different parts to this. So where you interpret it kind of depends on what your decision is here about what its coupling is and what its cohesion is. This part right here, and this here and this here, I'd say are pretty tightly coupled together. I'd say they're pretty tightly coupled together, partly because I know a little bit about how the hardware works in this case. And the way that the hardware works in this case is that when you're pushing buttons on the controller, the, the, the controller itself is just a bunch of dumb switches. So it's just making connections or not making connections. There's not much logic going on inside the controller itself. Inside the machine, there's a buffer of like what buttons you've pushed. So it's keeping track of that inside the machine. That's very tightly coupled. Yes, you can buy like third party Mad Cats controllers or something like that but it's tightly coupled to the machine itself. The other part is here. This is very tight coupling. You've got cartridges that plug into this slot. They are designed for this, this system. They have code that runs on this system and it doesn't run on any other system. It is very tightly coupled there. There's ports here. It's hard to see, I know, but there's a red one and a yellow one. This is like video and audio. Similar to the first example here, the, where we've got the video output ports, there's not tight coupling there. You can plug this Nintendo system into any TV that has those kinds of ports and it will just work. It doesn't matter what brand it is. The TV doesn't know that there's a Nintendo on the other side, it's just playing the picture that the Nintendo is spitting out on the other side. I'd say that this is a highly cohesive device in all parts. This is a highly cohesive device. Yeah, yeah, it does video and audio, but it's all for one purpose. You plug the cartridge in and it plays the game. And that's the high cohesion here is that everything is related and it's there for the purpose of playing a game and nothing else. The controller, I'd say itself is also kind of highly cohesive. This is the full complement of buttons that you have to have for this device. So so that, that controller itself is highly cohesive. Okay, I'm gonna move to things that are less abstract now. I'm gonna start showing you some code and I'm asking the same question. High cohesion, low cohesion, high coupling, low coupling. Here's the example. I'm gonna put one minute on, on my timer for you to read this. Talk about it with your team and then I'll switch to Mentimeter. 
Okay. So this code here, I'm going to say that this code has fairly tight coupling to Android, but it has low coupling to the rest of the system. So tight coupling to Android, I have to think about this in two ways. This is an Android class. It's very tightly coupled to Android's implementation. For our logic layer, this has very low coupling. It doesn't know or care about what the logic layer does. It doesn't need to know, it shouldn't know what the logic layer is doing. So it's got low coupling to our logic layer. At first glance, I would say that this has also pretty high cohesion. I would say that. But I'm going to pull back from that. This line here, validate course data. That line to me says that this is not a very cohesive piece of code. It's doing two things now. It's calling the logic layer and it's responsible for validating code or validating a course, I'm sorry. To make this more cohesive, what I would do is take this block, validate course data, and put it into the actual implementation here. One benefit that you're getting from that is that moving that validate logic into the logic layer means that when you do switch front ends, the validation is still done. You don't have to like copy and paste this validate code between two different implementations of a front end. This create course method should throw something. So this is related to what we were talking about last time. This should be responsible for catching an exception that that implementation throws. That would then make this highly cohesive. It's persisting something and then dealing with the consequences afterwards. OK? OK. Here's one last example here. Actually, this one spans two pages. OK. So I'm putting one minute on my timer for discussion. OK. So I, I agree with this. This is a tightly coupled piece of code, and it has low cohesion. It's tightly coupled. This is supposed to be the application logic layer. It's tightly coupled to Android. We're sending back stuff, sending stuff back to the activity that called us using Android specific classes, these parsable classes to send data between layers. This is tightly coupled with the Android implementation because a Java swing implementation doesn't need any of this. It doesn't do any of this stuff. If we were to make changes to this to try and have a Java UI, we'd have to go about changing all of this to do that. This has low cohesion because it's doing all this other junk. It's doing all this other crap that has to do with Android stuff that really has nothing to do with persisting courses to our persistence layer. So this is tightly coupled and it has low cohesion. So I would agree with your assessment here. All right. Let's skip past those. All right, good. <laughs> Great timing on my part today. Great job, me. Yeah, OK, good. You should now be able to describe and identify technical debt. You should be able to say, yeah, this is technical debt. This is the kind of technical debt it is based on the quadrant that Martin Fowler is describing in the tech debt quadrant. You should be able to release software on GitLab. You should be able to continue defining coupling of cohesion and decide whether specific examples have high or low coupling and cohesion.